I, I view this as a celebration of the voyage of discovery undertaken by the Impact Fellows this summer. And I think you will all very much enjoy hearing everything they have learned about plastic waste and recycling. A few words about the program uh, to start with. It's an eight week uh, intense full-time program, largely self-managed by the team uh, of undergraduates who take a deep dive into a problem that has both a sustainability and a social impact component. We deliberately and purposefully assemble teams with a range of backgrounds so that a broad and diverse set of perspective is brought to bear on the technical, economic, policy, regulatory, and social aspects of the, the subject or the problem at hand. The team often starts with the, a cursory familiarity with the topic and is faced with an extremely steep initial learning curve. And I'm delighted to say that this team, like its predecessors, has successfully overcome this challenge Greatly aided, I may add, by many conversations with domain experts and practitioners like some of you present today. Thank you for so readily sharing your knowledge and insights and suggestions with the team. Towards the end of the eight weeks, the team gets to the point where they can conduct a, com a comprehensive and in-depth analysis of the key elements of the problem based on all the information they have accumulated, all these conversations they have had. And then most importantly, they come up with a list of actionable recommendations. This is sort of the core of the project and uh, the culmination of all the hard work they have put in over the summer. So uh, we will go into the, the presentation and at any time uh, during the talk, uh, or after it is done, please submit any questions you may have via the Q&A function, and the team will address these at the conclusion of their talk. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to now hand the floor over to the stars of the event, the team. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Catherine. I'm going to be a senior this fall. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I major in earth systems with a concentration in environmental economics and policy. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Hawk, she, her pronouns. I'm going to be a junior this fall, and I'm majoring in mechanical engineering with a product realization concentration. Hey. My name is Robert Hurley. I'm a rising junior and I'm majoring in biology with a focus in biochem and biophysics. Hi, my name is Adrian Ayarko. I'm a rising sophomore. I will be majoring in civil engineering and minoring in computer science. Hi, everyone. My name is Shri. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be a sophomore this fall. And um, I'm majoring in engineering physics with a focus in energy. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. All right, so thank you everyone for your time today. We're very excited to present to you our research findings and recommendations on plastics recycling in California, a topic that our team of five spent the past eight weeks learning about. Before we start, we'd like to thank our mentors, Caroline, Kath, Donica, Elizabeth, and Brian for providing us the opportunity to learn so much more about the research process. Finally, thank you to everyone here today who contributed their valuable time and knowledge in our interviews. Um, also to everyone not here today and watching the, the recording, hi. <laughs> uh, to preface, this presentation is a framework to synthesize our learnings so we can reflect on our own opinions and understand how much is needed to make different kinds of impacts. This is not the end all be all and comes from our personal judgment after scouring many sources. Next slide, please. So today we will start by discussing briefly the current landscape and give you just a general overview of the problem. And then we will move on to our key takeaways from the research that we conducted over uh, this summer and highlight the main problems that are limiting the potential recycling. And then we will identify the root causes of these problems and the key stakeholders that can engage with these problems. 
and then which will lead to the recommendations, which will identify exactly what each key stakeholder can do to, um, to address these problems. And yeah, now I'll pass it over to Adria with the next slide. The Tomcat Impact Fellows utilize and synthesize information from a large amount of resources to create our report and list of recommendations. Our process began with over 20 interviews with stakeholders across the plastic supply chain, innovators, and activists. We then began independent research to further our knowledge of all aspects of plastic pollution and recycling. And in conjunction with many team meetings, the Tomcat Impact Fellows constructed our comprehensive report and recommendations. To begin, I'll hand it over to Julia to lay out the current plastic landscape. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you, Adria. Before we start getting into specifics, here's some contextual information on understanding our current landscape. About 70% of plastics used in the US every year is sent to landfill. And while this number changes a little every year, it is honestly a depressingly high number considering that most public perception of the national recycling rate would think it to be lower. And this also manifests itself not just in our daily uses, but also everywhere else imaginable. Every week we're ingesting a whole credit card's worth of plastic. If there are about 52 weeks in a year, that means each of us individually are eating much more plastic that's in our wallets every time our birthday comes around. This is because of how much microplastics have overwhelmed our natural ecosystems. And this is pretty evident with not only this rate of million metric tons, but also the infamous great garbage patch in the ocean and so much more. The effects of these statistics will be discussed later, but recognize that the plastics crisis is precisely that, the crisis. Uh, I'll hand it over to Catherine. Next slide. Oh, previous slide, Danica. She seems to be having Wi Fi issues. Hi, sorry, I got kicked off my Wi Fi just now. <laughs> With that baseline understanding of the global plastics problem and how we approach this research project, we'll begin to run through some of the research that we did, starting with the policy and economic context that drives the plastic crisis, then moving on to the health and justice ramifications because of the plastics problem, and then talk about some of the current technological innovations within the plastic space. So we can move to the next slide, please. So in terms of policy, we identified, identified four important policy changes that have affected the plastic landscape. First being that China announced the national sword in 2017, which banned 24 recyclable materials from entering the country, which included plastics. It limited contamination to 0.5% and increased enforcement inspections. The ban came after many recycling programs abroad transitioned from requiring consumers to separate their recyclable materials, which means putting their paper, their plastics, their cans and bottles into different bins and then exporting them that way. And instead they began to collect a single stream, which means all of those recyclables were put into the same bin and oftentimes with municipal waste as well. That led to a lot of contamination that the Chinese government had to deal with. And so as a result of the contamination, um, a lot of the materials were unusable, which drove down profits and was the impetus for the Chinese government to implement the national sword, which has completely changed the plastic landscape. Now in 2019, changes were made to the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Wastes and Their Disposals, which aimed to limit global trade in hazardous waste. This amendment included solid waste into the convention and that brought plastics into the scope. It also imposed tighter controls onto those importers and exporters. This amendment comes as a result of many industrialized countries exporting their waste to developing nations, oftentimes in the global South, leading to questions of distributional justice that Julia will get into later. Now, the impact of these 2019 changes has been that only clean shipments of contamination-free plastic waste have been allowed between countries. More locally to us, California has had some of the most successful recycling and product reuse programs thanks to the state's Integrated Waste Management Act of 1989. And in 2016, 
a great bill which ca called Proposition 67 um, banned the single use carry out bags within the state. Um, if any of you live in California, I'm sure you have noticed that we get paper bags and we even get charged for that, which is great. Lastly, and most recently, Maine passed the, their EPR bill LD 1541 on July 14th of 2021. EPR legislation holds the producers of plastic products responsible for all the negative environmental externalities and their associated costs. That means it's incentivizing manufacturers to design resource efficient and low impact products to decrease the cost of the externalities. It also helps facilitate the effective end of life collection and treatment of products for reuse and recycling. Again, related to California, um, the, our own EPR bill will be up on the ballot November 8th, 2022, which is really exciting. So we find the Chinese plastic ban to be the most influential policy of these four, as it has made waves in the plastics industry. As a result of the Chinese ban, globally, more plastics are ending up in landfills, incinerators, or just litter in the environment. Um, and also, there are rising costs to haul away recyclable materials, which has rendered the products increasingly unprofitable. It's also forced countries to have to figure out new ways of dealing with their own waste streams. And so we're actually hopeful that this change will lead to new recycling innovations within the space. Now I'll pass it off to Sri to explain why recycling is currently not a profitable, profitable business. If you could switch slides. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so as you can see from the figure, recycling averages to a loss of around $50.66 per ton of waste, while landfilling averages to around $42.66 worth of profit per ton of waste. And um, waste to energy plants average around $22 per ton of waste of profit. And from these figures, you could probably tell that in most cases, currently recycling is just not profitable. Except for plastics such as PET, for the most part, it's difficult to even just break even. And this is due to two main reasons. Firstly, there's a low demand for recycled plastics. Recycled plastics today are seen as an alternate to virgin plastics. So when the price of oil goes up, the price of virgin plastics goes up, and more people opt for recycled plastics, which then drives um, the price of recycled plastics up. And um, so because of this, the demand for recycled plastics does not depend on the current uh, landscape of the recycling market itself, but it depends on the oil market, which sometimes makes it difficult for recyclers to make a profit. Next, there is um, recycled plastics are always downcycle plastics. It's impossible to maintain the full quality of parent plastics. Um, but in many cases, they can still function well. Um, recyclers sometimes are not aware of the current market requirements or what I mean is like which plastics manufacturers are actually willing to buy. And because of this miscommunication or lack of it rather, many MRFs um, shred together plastics to produce a lower quality bale and this type of recycled plastic does not meet a lot of like plastic manufacturer requirements. Um, then there is lack of transparency in the supply chain. There is a lot of ambiguity in what is actually recycled and what is discarded, and exporting waste just magnifies this problem. Um, as a result, it becomes difficult for consumers and manufacturers to understand and trust recycled plastics. Um, the other part of the problem is poor supply of um, in-demand plastics. Recycled PET is an in-demand plastic. Um, California attains a supply of PET through um, curbside recycling or the redemption centers. Um, however, there have been closures of redemption centers in the past few years because um, of the poor economics. And the... And because of this, this has reduced the supply of PET available. Um, then the industry is also small and fragmented with several small actors compared to the virgin plastics industry, which has many big oil and profit that can be invested in R&D 
and also just ability to withstand market shocks, which makes it difficult for small actors to produce cheaper and higher quality supply. And finally, our current technology is just in a effective right now at achieving true circularity. Apart from PET, which can kind of go bottle to bottle, other plastics aren't really circular um, and they can't really be effectively recycled in some cases without adding large amounts of virgin plastics to compensate. Um, so we can advance the technology um, address later in this presentation. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and with that, um, plastic production we see is at an all-time high, and it makes sense for plastics infrastructure to be also widespread and growing, and that um, includes the effects of it, the human and planetary health. Um, so there are so many pieces of this puzzle, puzzle that all fall along the supply chain from fracking the pipelines to landfills, and each individual group has their own unique and concentrated impact on the people around them and the environment. At the front end, fossil fuel extraction methods, such as fracking, which is inextricably linked to plastic production, uses hundreds of toxic chemicals to contaminate groundwater and air, many of which are carcinogenic. And on top of what is released as the process is happening, most of the fracking fluids are left underground to continue to pollute. The pipelines used to transport this oil then poses dangers to anyone living near them as they're susceptible to fires, explosions, and oil spills. This all might be common knowledge and perhaps Many feel like the risk is a sacrifice to be made, but California has the second highest number of significant incidents in the US. That means almost 600 deaths, hospitalizations, or significant spills from 1986 to 2013. At the end of the plastic life cycle, the plastics that end up in landfills and the environment release methane at incredibly high rates to contribute to climate change, where municipal solid waste landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions in the US. And California happens to have the most landfills in the country, 300, which is almost double the second highest in Tennessee. Plastic pr processing and burning is especially polluting because it releases many hazardous pollutants that cause cardiovascular and respiratory diseases and cancer. Incinerators on their own have been found to release more toxic pollution than coal-fired power plants, specifically because they burn plastics, and cracking facilities and pr plastic production plants as a whole are similarly harmful. All of this amounts to um, the next slide, please. What was mentioned briefly in the introduction, widespread harm to the environment and to the human population. Um, sorry, actually, previous slide. <laughs> uh, more than 800 species are affected by marine plastic pollution, and many endangered species are included. So they are consuming plastics and die or continue to live and contaminate the rest of the food cycle and eventually reach us. But microplastics also are found in our drinking water and fruits and vegetables. And the long-term effects of this and our systems are still very much unknown and pose a risk to the future of the planet, both animal and human as we know it. Next slide. So social and environmental justice issues have also been amplified, but some of these issues have existed for as long as plastic production infrastructure has existed. Only with recent political movements have they surfaced to mainstream awareness. Some specific examples include these on the slide, um, where at this very moment, Enbridge, who operates the world's longest crude oil pipeline system, is expanding an oil pipeline, Line 3, in Minnesota, which is encroaching on the land of the, indig the indigenous community presiding there and leading to violent arrests and treaty rights violations. It's actually pretty upsetting because not only are the community's livelihoods being ruined, but the potential contribution of climate change it would bring would be higher than that of Minnesota's entire economy. I highly suggest if any of you have the time to later do a quick Google search of stopline3.org and learn more about the injustices happening there and finding ways to support it. Additionally, incinerators and plastic production plants disproportionately affect the lives and health of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as low-income populations as a whole. And a very clear example of this can be seen in Cancer Alley, which is about an 85-mile stretch of land in Louisiana with about 150 plants. The area is known for its inhumanely high risk for cancer directly attributed to the plants that are concentrated near residential areas and pollute the lives of the residents. For most of plastics, the company responsible for most of this even plans on expanding more in this area and community organizers have been continuously and rigorously quite literally fighting for their lives. 
Finally, with plastic exports shifting due to the national sword, as Catherine explained, much of the masses of plastic have been diverted not back to their original producer, but to countries mainly in Southeast Asia, like Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand, or overall the global south. This puts unnecessary pressure on the facilities there because not only are they getting more plastic that they can process, much of the garbage is actually mislabeled, contaminated, and unprocessable. This dynamic has shown to be a redirection of a problem rather than a solution and perpetuates more harm than good. I'll now pass it on to Robert to discuss current recycling strategies. Thanks, Julia. Recovery rates in the current recycling industry are much too low. Every type of plastic is technically recyclable, but for many of them, it is not practical or economic to do so. Plastics are only recycled when they are economical to recycle. Most material recovery facilities only recycle PET and HDP. Plastic waste that is sorted but not effective to recycle is exported, and current policy allows this to be labeled as recycling. These plastics often go to developing countries that do not have the infrastructure to recycle them, and there's often not transparency in what is actually done with it. In reality, much of this waste is likely not recycled and ends up in the environment. Plastics that are not exported are either landfilled or incinerated. Landfilling is currently the largest sector for plastic waste, but moving forward, it should be avoided whenever possible because there's only so much room available. An analysis conducted by the Environmental Research and Education Foundation estimates that all currently operating U.S. landfills will be full in just over 60 years. As we heard from Julia, there are also many serious concerns about landfill pollution. While landfilling has its issues, incineration is not much better as an alternative. Advantages of incineration are that it reduces waste volume by 87% and produces value in the form of energy. However, incinerators, especially those that burn plastics, have many detrimental effects on the environment, arguably more so than landfilling. There are several reports that identify incinerators as having serious health implications for those who live near them in the form of cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. While the most popular plastic waste pathways are currently landfilling incineration, both of these negatively impact the environment and plastics should instead be recycled. Most recycling done currently is mechanical recycling in the form of extrusion. This process produces regranulated material by melting and applying shear force to plastic that have already been sorted, cleaned, and shredded. However, the lack of uniformity in plastic waste even among individual polymers, makes degradation with subsequent extrusions almost inevitable. Current technologies can only reprocess plastics a few times before the damage to material properties is too great to continue use. As opposed to mechanical, chemical recycling converts plastics from their polymer forms back into their individual monomers, which can then be used to remake polymers similarly to virgin plastic creation. Without the performance degradation involved with mechanical recycling, chemical recycling could potentially be done infinite times. However, there are a lot of unknowns in the process, including potential environmental impacts. And another problem is that many chemical processes cannot, are possible but are not practical due to limited availability of chemical resources, issues with increasing the reaction scale, and also a common issue of affordability. The only way for chemical recycling industry to expand is to the development of economically viable and environmentally sustainable chemical reactions. Some examples of potential recycling solutions are included on the next slide. There are several innovative companies that are working to advance recycling technology. It is imperative that more research and development for these new innovations are conducted because without new technologies, plastic waste will likely remain to be an issue. Resource Chemistry Corporation has a mission to one day replace petroleum-based plastics with carbon dioxide-based plastics that have equivalent or improved properties. They have already made great progress to achieve this goal for PET. The polymer that will replace PET is called polyethylene furanoid, or PET, which has increased barrier properties greater tensile strength, higher melting point. It is also 100% recyclable, compostable, and displays biodegradability. PEF is used by 
PEFT is created using CO2 and edible biomass in a way that carbon negative and low cost. Resource has developed technology that can produce this polymer more efficiently than ever before, and they are taking steps to commercialize this process. Due to PEF's superior material properties and degradability, it has the potential to completely replace PET and should do so once it is being sustainably produced commercially. Neopave is a road paving company that has developed a higher performing alternative to asphalt known as NEO, which can be made from road waste and contaminated PET. NEO is a urethane-based binder that when used to make roads lasts six to 15 times longer than asphalt. Because NEO is made from recycled asphalt and PET, it is also more eco-friendly than conventional asphalt. One pound of NEO can be produced for 40 cents and sold for three times profit. While their current infrastructure could not re support repaving of all roads ever made, NEO should likely one day replace asphalt worldwide. Nova Loop is a chemical recycling company that has created a process to upcycle polyethylene or PE polymer waste. PE is the most abundant plastic in the world and the majority of it is not being recycled. Nova Loop's technology turns polyethylene waste into thermoplastic polyurethane elastomers or TPU, which are highly um, value plastics and high performance. Nova Loop is preparing to move their process to a large scale. Gilix is a waste management company that would like to help all organizations to recycle more plastic. Gilix's branch company, Cyclix, chemically characterizes waste streams for other companies. Cyclix is a plastic feedstock provider and Gilix is an advanced technology provider. Gilix is targeting the hard to recycle plastics, codes three to seven. Gilix's current operation, Regenix, is the first ever commercial recycling facility that can recycle polystyrene. Polystyrene waste is hardly recycled, and it is strongly encouraged that more facilities like Regenix are created. PureCycle Technologies is the only company that can recycle polypropylene waste that is of equivalent quality to virgin polypropylene. Polypropylene waste comprises a large amount of all plastic waste, and almost no one is recycling it. PureCycle currently has contracts to build multiple large facilities across the U.S. that will recycle half a million metric tons of plastics by 2025. If this facility is economically sustainable and environmentally safe, then it should be supported and expanded. Phoenix Fibers is a startup company that uses enzymes to upcycle waste. These enzymes can target multiple plastic polymers that are mixed and blended and recover and recycle them without any sorting required. Phoenix Fibers has interest in recycling the plastics that are within waste fabrics as $46 billion worth of textiles are thrown away every year. While their company is still in development, it has great promise to recycle many plastics that are not currently being recycled. Each of these businesses successfully expand and distribute their technologies. The only non-recyclable plastics will be PVC and some Code 7 plastics. We will now look at some root causes for issues within the industry. Throughout our research and interviews, we identified five root causes to address for which we provided actionable recommendations. In no particular order, we found that one, virgin plastics are economically favorable and rising consumerism keeps demand up for plastics. Two, consumers don't have full information necessary to successfully participate in recycling. Three, Recycling infrastructure is fragmented and insufficient. Four, there are no implementable technical solutions to replace current products. Five, there is a lack of accountability from big oil and big plastic pollution on planetary health. We have also identified several stakeholders that will play important roles in each of our recommendations. Next slide. Those stakeholders are governments, NGOs, plastic manufacturers, waste management companies, Consumers, academia, research institutions, startups, distributors, producers, environmental organizations, and environmental foundations. Each of these stakeholders will play in different roles in different recommendations, and these entities have the power needed to make actionable change and fulfill our recommendations. I will now hand it off to Catherine to address our first root cause. Thank you for that. So just before we get sorted into our into the root causes, I want to explain the slide to you. So 
first off, like Julia said at the top of the hour, oh, sorry, could you, could you skip forward two slides? Thank you. <laughs> Just before we get started, like Julia said at the top of the hour, these are our subjective perspectives. They are what we think could be good solutions uh, after our research and listening to all of you. Um, and so on the left-hand side, we have a table of the stakeholders that we've identified for each root cause and potential solutions for those stakeholders. On the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see a, a graph that graph uh, charts level of impact versus level of effort. These are just a framework we use to synthesize our learning. Um, it's not based on quantitative data. It's based on what we've learned and qualitative um, assumption making based on various interests and political feasibility um, and what we think their impact would be. So let's get into the first root cause. The first root cause is virgin plastics are economically favorable and rising consumerism keeps demand up for plastics. So as Sri mentioned, the current economic system greatly favors the usage of new virgin plastics and consumer demand for these new plastic products exacerbates that. To counteract this, we believe that government needs to enact new policy and legislation. This includes expanding the Basel Convention rules on exporting plastics, we need to stop or lower exports. Reducing or eliminating plastic waste exports helps incentivize recycling. Furthermore, it ensures a localized supply of plastics that are easy to require for reuse. Second, we should force firms to internalize the negative externalities of using virgin plastics by pricing them at their true social cost via a tax. Next, following in Maine's lead, we must pass legislation or bolster existing policy that requires extended producer responsibility. We should only have the chasing arrows sign on recyclable products as this leads to misinformation for consumers. And five, following in California's footsteps, we should ban the use of single use plastics. Now onto consumers. Consumers can vote with their wallets and demand transparency from the producers and distributors they purchase from. But consumers are also part of this problem. We need to stop buying new items and decrease our consumption. Startups need to innovate. New technologies are crucial to addressing the plastics problem. Now, I think solutions two and three, meaning the tax and EPR, would have the most impact, but are also very difficult to pass because of political feasibility. So you'll see that through the rest of these slides, you have to, we have to balance feasibility versus its impact and effort. So on to the next slide, please. Our second root cause is that consumers do not have the full information necessary to successfully participate in recycling. Our recommendations for this root cause is a multifaceted approach utilizing governments, consumers, waste management facilities and companies, environmental organizations and foundations and producers. Our first set of recommendations involve government. First, local governments must offer continued accessible and user-friendly education about recycling to the public. Information about what happens to material after it is sorted by the consumers and whether or not material re labeled recyclable is actually recycled and what material belongs in the recycling bin must be made available to the public. Literature with large pictures and concise messaging creates high readability, and this form should be an outline for the information distributed. Digital literature can be distributed through web pages or mobile applications, and physical literature should also be created to be distributed through mail services or made available at city buildings. Next, as Catherine touched on earlier, to ensure that consumers are not misguided and are able to make educated decisions about what plans to buy from, governments must regulate the use of chasing arrows on packaging. Chasing arrows are often used as a marketing strategy to convince consumers that they are purchasing products that are not contributing to global plastic pollution. Chasing arrow symbols should be limited to material that has demonstrated economically viable and environmentally sound recyclability, compostability, or reusability. Next, to ensure that the youth are properly educated about the correct recycling practices, recycling education campaigns should be launched by local governments in partnership with local environments local environmental organizations and waste management facilities in schools teaching students from K through eight. Most people recall minimal emphasis being placed on proper recycling practices in schooling past elementary school. 
Therefore, we recommend that educational campaigns are longer. The students old enough to effectively retain and utilize the information they learn are exposed. The continued reinforcement of the proper recycling practices, such as how to, stop, how to sort properly, is used to ensure that as students grow into adults, they are well-informed and become an active part of reducing plastic pollution. Our second set of recommendations involve consumers. Consumers must use the information made available to them to make educated and informed decisions about what brands and companies to buy from. As Catherine stated, consumers can vote with their wallets. If consumers consciously choose to buy products with packaging that is sustainable, producers may be forced to shift to more sustainable packaging designs to appease consumers. Next, consumers must also use the information made available to them to sort and clean household waste prop properly. Ensuring that contamination does not enter the waste stream drastically reduces the cost of sorting and recycling plastics. Our third set of recommendations involved waste management facilities and companies. Local waste man management facilities or material recovery facilities can assist in providing accurate recycling information in the ways that consumers can sort their waste properly. This information should include how consumers can, as I said, re recycle properly, accurate recycling rates, and what happens to waste after it's collected. This information should be used in recycling literature released by local governments, but waste management facilities and companies should also engage in their own outreach, such as giving tours of the facilities or recycling webinars open to the community. Maintaining a high level of transparency will not only create effective literature, but rally the support of consumers to improve processes. Our third set of recommendations involve environmental organizations and foundations. Local environmental groups and organizations can supply the volunteers to staff the recycling education campaigns in schools. These volunteers can teach students directly and engage with the community directly to explain recycling practices simply. We acknowledge the cost associated with recycling education campaigns. So utilizing volunteers from nonprofits may be an effective way to minimize costs. Our fifth set of recommendations involve waste, involve producers. Lastly, it is the responsibility of producers to accurately label, practice, label packaging of products or chasing arrows in order to not mislead consumers who are purchasing their products. Producers must follow regulations provided by governments and, dem and demonstrate the recyclability, reusability, or composability of the packaging and products they use to use the chasing arrows symbol. The recommendation we identified as having the highest impact and lowest effort for this root cause is for waste management facilities to, to provide accurate recycling information. This recommendation just requires waste management facilities to make public information that, they've already made, that they already have available to them, as well as providing information about how consumers can properly sort material actually helps minimizing sorting effort. If consumers are already sorting material properly, investments in high-grade sorting machines can be reallocated to making more effective recycling systems. I will now hand it off to Sri to talk about our next root cause. Recycling infrastructure is frag fragmented and insufficient. To counteract this, governments can provide financial support for recycling, especially in underserved areas. This can either be done through helping or subsidizing curbside recycling programs, um, most cities in California already have moderate to good access to recycling, but in low, lower income communities and rural areas, recycling infrastructure is especially lacking. Um, and providing financial support to these areas can help overcome this. This leads to point number two. In the last few years, as I mentioned previously, redemption centers across California have been closing due to poor economics. Um, bills have been re, uh, introduced to help reestablish redemption centers. Um, however, we will still need additional funding to establish redemption centers in underserved areas. Three, in California, patchwork legislation, which just refers to variation in recycling programs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, creates confusion for several stakeholders, disincentivizing them from recycling properly. Um, standardizing some of the framework when possible, i.e. just defining what is recyclable and what isn't from jurisdiction to jurisdiction can help with this. Um, this leads to consumers. As Catherine and Adria already alluded to, consumers should continue to opt for recycling programs and support them. Recycling is nowhere near perfect today, but 
by supporting these programs, they can help cons uh, create a consistent supply and demand that is needed to boost the industry. Um, five, the recycling industry is small and fragmented, especially compared to these huge oil companies. And in order to reap the benefits of economies of scale, withstand market shocks, um, waste management companies, startups, and recyclers can partner with each other and reap the benefits of just partnering with each other. Um, six, NGOs and environmental agencies can help improve access to recycling to underserved communities by helping them finance or make budget plans to invest in recycling infrastructure. And they can also act as a communicator between stakeholders to help um, manufacturers and consumers understand this patchwork legislation and how they can best work around it. Um, eight, plastic manufacturers could help invest in recycling infrastructure, either as part of government mandated EPR programs or corporate uh, social responsibility, although we know that the latter is probably much less likely to happen. And although this is more of a band-aid solution, it poses as an interim solution where we can incentivize recycling instead of landfilling, which is the lesser evil. And um, the ideal solution would be shifting towards reusable materials, but this is not always possible. And in cases where it is, it will still take significant time and effort um, since the norms and infrastructure right now support the use of virgin plastics. Um, and lastly, plastic manufacturers should also create partnerships with different stakeholders. For example, they could partner with recyclers to create more circular supply chains. Um, recyclers can pr um, provide a specific type of recycled plastics to manufacturers and manufacturers can produce recyclers with a consistent source of plastics to recycle. And um, this is a win-win partnership. Both, um, both partners benefit from each other. And they can, um, manufacturers can also partner with NGOs and seek advice and help on working around patchwork legislation or just simply understanding the legislation in, in their local area and um, figure out how they can incorporate recycling into their activities. Partnerships are relatively low effort compared to some of these other recommendations, but they can have a really big impact, especially when adopted by big companies. And you can move to the next slide. Great. As discussed before, there are many potential innovations rising, but there are still no immediate technical solutions to replace current products. The pathway to replacing virgin plastics is a gradual journey, but there are specific recommendations that are aligned with this goal. Firstly, startups with viable solutions need to demonstrate that their technology will work on the commercial scale. Companies like Angelix that have already created large scale facilities should work to expand even more. And as Catherine said earlier, successful recycling innovations will decrease the demand for virgin plastics. Companies also need to share and advertise their technologies. The technology could be an entire process or it could be a design feature like a label or container closure. The best technologies need to be implemented. For example, polystyrene should not be only recycled by Agilix. Other companies need to know about and be using this process. Innovative solutions need to be widely known and available in order to make a greater impact on the industry. Similar to the solution on the last slide, distributors need to invest in alternatives to plastics. Whether this is distributing paper to go containers instead of plastic ones, or like Nestle working to package foods in fiber wrappers instead of plastic ones, wherever there is an opportunity to opt out of plastics, it should be done. Distributors should also reduce plastic use whenever possible. Unnecessary plastic packaging, fillers, and wrappings should not be included or should be replaced with non plastics. Waste management companies need to invest in new technologies. Whenever a new process that will improve recycling becomes commercially available, waste management companies need to purchase them. Similarly to the partnerships described by Sri, waste management companies should also work together with other companies to optimize as many facilities as possible and to spread the best technology available. No company should be keeping secrets and acting in their own interest. 
tackle this problem, companies must work together. The role that consumers play, as previously mentioned, is to support and purchase any alternatives to plastic and reduce short-term plastic products whenever possible. Academic and research institutions need to fund research for new recycling technology. It will take the world's smartest minds to innovate solutions for plastics, and we need them to be motivated to do so. As some of us have already suggested, governments need to create economic incentives that work against virgin plastics. One solution is for governments to place caps for the production of virgin plastics. With the growing population and economy, plastic producers are only going to produce more. Governments should also give tax breaks for companies that are working on products and processes that are proven to be environmentally friendly. Any possible incentives that will make companies want to help the environment should be given. The solution with the greatest impact of these would be for waste management companies to purchase and use the newest innovation. If every MRF had the same technologies as PureCycle, Agilix, and Novaloop, then codes one and two wouldn't be the only plastics considered recyclable. The solutions that require the most effort are creating commercial innovations and government policies. If any of these are realized, then they will have huge implications for the future of the industry. Next slide. So the final root cause is there is a lack of accountability from big oil and big plastic um, companies and their impacts on planetary and human health. I summarized earlier the various impacts and injustices of big plastic infrastructure, but in terms of the progress they've made to resolve these issues, we have yet to see change great enough to bring justice to communities and be environmentally sound enough to make substantial progress that the world needs to prevent climate change from getting out of hand even more than it already has. Thus, I selected five stakeholders that can make an impact on this issue. Firstly, with the government, of course, reducing production is one of the most impactful ways to reduce all impacts that plastic has on the world, but particularly targeting production would tackle the root cause of these problems. Thus, we have solution one and three indicated as the highest level of effort, but highest level of impact as well. Solution one is to apply a tax and or impose a cap and trade program such that regulation is placed directly to prevent the industry from expanding more and increasing plastic production. Similarly, solution three entails divestment from fossil fuel, which would address its impact at all areas along the supply chain and would lead to a better future as renewable and sustainable operations are prioritized. Solution two is regulating emissions and waste, particularly because to keep big oil, big plastic companies accountable on protecting planetary and human health, we can look to the effects of infrastructure, as I've previously mentioned. So making regulation that pressures facilities to be cleaner would reduce their current harms on local communities and the environment. As an example, the EPA is in charge of upkeeping these regulations, but as of current evidence and in our report, we believe they need to be pushed to do a little bit more. Um, maybe a lot more, but we'll explain in the report. <laughs> On the opposite end of the impact and effort spectrum, solutions four and five, consumers can first avoid purchasing single-use plastics and lean more towards products made of material from a renewable and ethical source. As Catherine mentioned, consumers have huge purchasing power and can affect the plastic industry if they induce a paradigm shift that also shifts demand away from harmful and not sustainable products. However, this is a bit of a numbers game will require substantial engagement to capture the attention of corporations, but once their demand changes and they know their customers care about these issues, their actions will follow. Similarly, pressuring big plastic companies for more transparency on the extent of their waste and environmental pollution will highlight concrete evidence of their impact and companies can be held responsible in this way. Next is plastic manufacturers. Oh, sorry, yep. Where communicating and collaborating with environmental organizations and nonprofits would be critical to foster effective dialogue to make communities safer and healthier around their facilities. Manufacturers will discuss with representatives who are the voice of the people, thus, they can better serve a plethora of their needs and be held directly accountable for their actions. While changes may be difficult to do economically, communication is essential to raise awareness and push for action. A solution that would perhaps require more effort but also have great impact would be if manufacturers manufacturers themselves invest in zero emissions and eliminate water contamination as soon as possible so they stop contributing to the declining health of local communities. If their facilities continue to produce with minimal impact, they will not need to be replaced or removed because of their harms. 
Environmental organizations and nonprofits have been doing great work for arguably as long as plastic infrastructure has been around and have been one of the main forces of kind of accountability that we see today. Thus continuing their work and preferably getting better funding for it is vital to this cause area. Firstly, their work countering big plastic lobbyists is important as we've learned they've been paid enormous amounts of money to push for the corporate agenda and push for more lenient policies such as resisting the chasing arrows regulation that Adria mentioned was so important for recycling. Furthermore, by pushing for sustainable initiatives, more effective regulation can be imposed onto companies so that they can be forced to be greener. Finally, distributors and producers can both prioritize using products derived from renewable material and weaning off of single-use plastics, as well as striving ultimately towards operating a zero waste, as this will influence the market and influence the big plastic industry to do better. I'll hand it off for Robert to wrap this up. Sorry, never mind. <laughs> um, okay, next slide. Uh, so yeah, we wanted to end this presentation with final messages and a call to action because with all the research conducted and the various people we've interviewed, there was one main theme that we knew was essential to all this work. And that was that we have to work together with all of us on top of hundreds, if not thousands or hundreds of thousands of more organizations in the world working on the same plastic issue. Many are tackling it from different focus areas. However, many are also working on the same. By centering collaboration, groups of people who share similar work and combine their resources and strengthen them. Um, this would not be possible without communication and transparency. Across all stakeholders, we each have our own responsibility and capability to make change. But if we don't share our perspectives, we will be deeply missing out on critical information, like a puzzle missing its pieces. Communication and transparency will ensure that change is made effectively and we can maximize our impacts by understanding all necessary perspectives and thus addressing all kinds of problems, big and small. Then with this strong foundation, we can develop interdisciplinary solutions that don't just address one end of the spectrum of issues, but multiple. As we said before, a hybrid solution is necessary to solve a multifaceted issue. This is why we repeated some similar solutions between each cause area, because we know that they will affect change in multiple ways. Furthermore, as people with more power have more responsibility to make more widespread changes, those with more local powers can address the issues at their own unique standpoints. However, bottom line, we must improve planetary and human health and prioritize those first and foremost. People and animals are dying because of plastics and the infrastructure behind it and will continue to. Climate change is worsening. While funding is necessary and money is sadly very essential to the world we live in, we cannot let financial benefit or loss keep us from doing what is right. To prioritize health is to ensure that we don't turn a blind eye to consequences that develop into things like Cancer Alley. And with progress and collaboration, we hopefully won't let it happen again. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, that was a very a uh, comprehensive overview of your project. And uh, uh, I think it sort of exemplified the complexity of the issues and the interlinked nature of the problem that you took a look at. So if anybody has questions, uh, could, you, uh, could you please enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to them. We don't have a huge amount of time left, but we'll try to get them as soon as possible. Um, Okay, so I have maybe a, uh, a couple of questions here that uh, I would like to pose to the team, but uh, Donica, did you want to have uh, Caroline just say a few words? So Caroline was the uh, graduate teaching assistant to help the team with this project and uh, she would like to maybe say a few words. Yes, can everyone hear me? Yes. Amazing, uh, great job team. Again, thank you for such an informative presentation. I know the team has come a long way and 
it's uh, certainly not a, an easy problem for us to, to tackle. Um, so thanks, Byron, for making our life so hard over the summer and uh, really grinding us and uh, mostly the, the team. Um, and I hope this is a good learning experience. I mean, part of the big part of the learning is to help sim simplify and distill all these um, takeaways, which I think the team did a really good job. So yeah, just really happy and, and glad. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. So I have a question here from Julie Muir to the team. And uh, Julie's question is, what technology needs to be developed to better recycle plastics? Where should the research be focused? I know you touched upon a few things uh, in the course of the presentation, but if you had to prioritize, um, it would be uh, interesting to hear what your views on this are. Robert, you kind of spoke to it, so maybe you can feel this question. Yeah, I really think any solutions that can expand recycling to like new polymer types would really be ideal. And anything that can maybe increase the efficiency or like or decrease the degradation involved with recycling because you know, we can only do it a few times and really recycling would be able to reuse the same material over and over again. Um, yeah, so just expanding the amount of material that can be recycled, I think is really the main focus. Um, I would, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I would also say um, plastics three to seven, um, they've often been labeled as like plastics that are technically recyclable but actually aren't and we've seen just like a lot of like inconsistencies across all plastics when it comes to all the different um, facilities and so on and so forth and so i think bottom line like trying to make sure that all, all recyclables that are labeled recycled that they are labeled recyclable are being recycled because that is not the case a lot of them are going to landfills as we've seen how high the 70 percent is so as um, technology that can ensure that that recycling rate goes um, a lot higher and landfilling rate goes a lot lower. Um, a lot to do with kind of circular economies, but also like Robert said, innovative um, technologies that can keep this um, re renewable plastic, I guess, idea going, that would be great. But making sure that plastics are actually being recyclable is key. And that's what I, yeah, and one more thing, I think really product innovations that can replace plastics would be the ideal overall. Like anything that can be, doesn't have to be recycled, it can just go into the environment safely, but still provide all the properties necessary with plastics. Those would be the best solutions. I see that Matt uh, Cannon, the director of the Tomcat Center, is uh, has got yes. the flow. Matt, would you like to make a few comments or ask uh, yeah, a question? Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I, I just want to uh, just make a, a brief remark and then and then ask a question if I could. Uh, yeah, all I all I wanted to say was you know congratulations uh, to the team. I'm extremely impressed with uh, the breadth of this project uh, and and the depth of your analysis. Um, it's, it's just an incredibly complex uh, problem that uh, touches on so many different aspects, you know, technology, government, policy, social, uh, corporations, et cetera. So uh, you, you really did an amazing job of managing all that and putting together a, uh, a coherent and uh, I think quite insightful uh, presentation. So congratulations. Um, a, a number of things it, it kind of uh, uh, you know, surprising and interesting to me. Uh, well, one, one question, I guess, that I'll, and I'll try to phrase it as specifically as possible. So, so this issue about transparency, about what actually gets recycled um, and education, you know, most consumers maybe aren't aware that most of what they're throwing into the bin is, is going to end up in a landfill or, 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 or worse, just sort of improperly disposed of. So it, would you go so far as to say we should just 
make the blue bin exclusively for say PET and HDPE or the two plastics that are in reality recycled and just say that everything else has to go in the, the black landfill bin. Um, I, you know, I find myself even getting fooled because I have a huge blue bin and a small black bin. And so, yeah, I, every week I fill up the, the blue bin and you sort of feel, you know, without thinking about it, like, wow, okay, I'm, I'm doing what's, what's right. I'm not putting that much in the landfill, but, but the reality is, as you know, is, is, is not the case. So, so would that be a specific recommendation just to say, uh, you know, then people would just be more aware of how much waste they're actually generating. And, and hopefully we could, you know, make it easier on the recyclers, uh, at, at, you know, just because they're now they're just handling, you know, one or two streams. So I'd be curious to know what your thoughts about, about that as a policy and the prospects of trying to get that, um, get that approved. Um, I personally think this would be an extremely effective way to communicate to consumers what material they are placing into blue bins is actually being recycled. So as um, Heidi Sanborn said, as Julia, as Catherine and I said, the chasing arrows are incredibly misleading. And I think only, only allowing recyclable PET bottles to be um, types one and two to be put into recycling bins would be the most effective way to communicate to consumers what exactly um, is being recycled and not ending up in, in landfills as they are now. And to add on to that, um, sorry, uh, sort of like you alluded to, consumers, we get like this warm, fuzzy feeling when we think that we're like saving the earth um, by recycling. But I think just the visual image of seeing how much less you are able to recycle would be incredibly powerful from the consumer side um, because we are so unaware. Now, feasibility wise, I just know that there would be so many lobbying groups chasing that down. Um, Cause there's a reason that the chasing arrow sign is on products that are labeled resin code seven, which aren't even recyclable. Um, just doing a survey of our friends, no one knew that seven wasn't recyclable. So I just, I would find it very hard to believe that that could be an implementable policy solution, at least in the next five years, though it would be incredibly impactful. Thank you. Just a really small uh, snippet, um, also included in a report, so you can also read that. Um, the plastics product design and the use of plastics that aren't recyclable include like plastics that are like, colored like green and brown plastics. Um, so the uh, onus of the, the, to fix recycling as a whole, like with this misconception would be to change design to make sure that um, things like labels are being um, separated properly and it's all of that kind of stuff, caps and bottles um, and all these different kinds of numbers. Um, if the labels are fixed, if the design is fixed, then that would make it a lot easier for consumers to do what is right. So we have a couple of, uh, we have a question and a comment. We have one from uh, Nick. Uh, the legislature is actually two weeks away from passing a ban on chasing arrows on unrecyclable plastics. Thanks for all the research. So congratulations to Nick and the whole team, Heidi's, uh, Heidi's band of merry uh, uh, troublemakers who are uh, making a big uh, effort in changing uh, the rules out in Sacramento. So I think that's a, that's a very positive thing that resonates with a lot of what you have said. And I think what needs to happen is this has to happen on a much larger scale. Uh, Julie Muir had a question and she said, looking locally, what should Stanford do to reduce plastics and increase plastics recycling on campus? Um, based on what you have learned, are there any things that we should be doing that we're not already doing? One thing that I noticed is that even though in our dorms, we have a lot of we have the separated bins and in the dining halls, we have the separated bins. Uh, it's really hard to find separated bins when you're on the go. I'm thinking right now of Tresseter, um, which is like where our food, there's a food court there and it's where a lot of visitors go after tours um, and it's by the bookstore. And I know that there is one separated bin by the bookstore, um, but besides that, it's really hard to find when you're on the go and just little tweaks like that 
um, we think would be helpful. We were talking about that on the municipal level just the other day of how helpful it is just to see the visual color separation um, and know that you have access to that no matter where you are is great. Great, I think we've run over time and we probably should wrap things up right now. So once more, thank you so much to the team. Uh, the presentation uh, and the full report will be made available to all of you uh, who uh, helped us and participated with us on this journey. And I'd like to thank Caroline once more for her help and Dr. Kat, uh, Professor Kat, who also helped the team on the research and writing side. Uh, thank you very much to Donica and Elizabeth who provided support to the team. And uh, once more, great job guys and a round of applause to all of you. Thank you.